Bose is the presenting partner of Beyond the Grid. That's because Bose QuietComfort 35.2 goes beyond what you would expect from a pair of headphones. Just flip the switch to experience the industry-leading active noise reduction feature and all distractions of the world around you fade away, allowing you to focus fully on what matters to you. Hi, I'm Pierre Gasly. You're listening to Beyond the Grid. Hi F1 fans, it's TC here with another episode of Beyond the Grid. Now this week's guest is a bit of a young'un, but just because he's young, it doesn't mean he doesn't have a very interesting tale to tell. At the age of just 22, he exudes the kind of maturity and experience of someone much older, which is a good thing because he's about to hit the big time. After a season and a bit of dazzling drives with Toro Rosso, he's set to leapfrog up the order next year when he joins Red Bull Racing as teammate to none other than Max Verstappen. Yes, I'm talking of course about Pierre Gasly. Pierre comes from good racing stock as befits someone from Rouen, the former home of the French Grand Prix. He has an impeccable CV from the junior formulas, which includes championship glory in GP2 and a near title winning season in Super Formula in Japan. Those kinds of credentials are just one of the reasons why his intra-team battle with friend and former karting foe Verstappen will be unmissable in 2019. We caught up for a natter at Pierre's hotel in Russia, and that impending rivalry with Max was just one of the subjects we discussed. He's courteous, he's engaging, and he's an excellent storyteller. I hope you enjoy. Pierre, welcome to Be On The Grid. It's great to have you with us. You've been a Formula One driver for pretty much 12 months now. Exactly. I think it's a one year anniversary now. Started in, in Malaysia last year. A lot's happened. A lot a lot's happened in the last uh, in the last 12 months for me. It's been uh, an amazing uh, year, the best so far in my career and I've never never felt uh, as happy as I am now. So yeah, pretty pretty crazy, intensive, but uh, amazing uh, um, last few months. You know how as a kid you have all these hopes and ambitions of I want to get to Formula One. Has it lived up to expectations so far? Just Formula One, everything about it. I will say clearly and and almost even better than than I thought. Um, yeah, of course, when I was a dream, I started to, my family was involved in motorsport, but first of all, they were big, uh, big fans and, and passionate about Formula One. So uh, since I am born every weekend, my family on the Sunday, we had the family dinner, uh, family lunch, and uh, and with the TV on watching the, the, the races. So since uh, really little, I started to, to watch F1. And, um, and yeah, I dreamt about it uh, straight away. You know, I was every weekend, Michael Schumacher on the top step, spraying champagne um, and, and I tell I told my parents you know what I I want to be like these guys so yeah it was a big dream and and yeah to see where I am now compared to a couple of years ago it wasn't um, so long um, time ago is is, is pretty uh, pretty crazy and and yeah it feels it feels mega and have you got used to the idea of being a Red Bull racing driver next year <laughs> <laughs> Not not really, um, because yeah, of, of course it's something something amazing, and and I know next year is gonna be a, a a fantastic season, fantastic opportunity for myself, and and of course it's it it's massive, you know, for me. Of course, when I joined Red Bull in in 2013, was my target long long term target to to join Red Bull Racing, but when I came in Formula One 12 months ago, I I did an experiment. So I didn't think that I will be in that position today, um, even though that's what I, I targeted and, and that's what I, I dreamed about. Um, but I didn't expect it to come so quickly. And um, and yeah, I'm just super excited about uh, about that challenge. So when you heard Daniel's news, Ricardo going to Renault, leaving Red Bull Racing, were you straight on the telephone to help Marco? How did uh, it work? What, what? Uh, actually, yeah. So Elmut was straight on the phone when he got the news. He from rang Daniel. you, or you yeah, rang him? He, he rang me. Um, so before, just before the news was uh, was out, and he told me, okay, just to let you know, Daniel is out. And at that time, honestly, I was I was shocked because I didn't didn't expect it, didn't believe it in a way. Um, so at the beginning, I actually thought that he was a bit uh, taking the piss out of me, 
and really quickly and the, stu and the studio was serious so uh, of course yeah my first thought was like oh, okay then there might be a you know an opportunity and, and he just told me okay enjoy the break um, take it easy and and I will call you back to to let you know uh, our decision in the next couple of days or weeks did he but give you any indication nothing at all? nothing he just told me take it easy enjoy your break and and I'll call you back and um yeah, I mean, of course, you know, you're in summer, you try to disconnect, but it's impossible knowing that there is an, uh, an available uh, seat in the in the top team. So I've tried to think about something else, just enjoy my time. But of course, every day I was thinking, okay, what are they going to do? Uh, what, uh, what are the options? And I think it was a, a pretty tight fight between Carlos and, and myself, even if uh, potentially there were other candidates. And yeah, it just rang me two weeks later to tell me they decided to take me for 2019 so was uh yeah clearly the the, the best news of my career so far uh, but actually it was uh it was a bit funny we were speaking with max as well um so so max was giving me a bit of uh insights uh, oh, from, during from, that two weeks yeah period. during that two weeks and and just uh uh yeah giving giving me some fresh news when uh, when he got some so uh no it was uh was of course a long 10, 10 days, two weeks, and and when I got the the phone call from Helmut, I knew it was either positive or or, or negative. Um, and and finally, yeah, he just told me, okay, Pierre, you're gonna be a Red Bull driver in 2019. Um, so keep pushing and and prepare yourself the best way possible to to have a great season with us next year. Do you think Max was batting for you? Was he pushing for you to join him? Do you think? For sure, we have like great relationship with Max. We we know things a lot of time. We race together in karting and we had uh, a lot of battles. And I think, of course, today we we've got a um, a really strong uh, relationship and friendly uh, in a way. So we've got a lot of respect and and yeah, we should ask him. But I think for sure um, it was. It wasn't again the fact that I will I, I will be uh, I will be his teammate. That's uh, that's clear. But then after for more details, I think that the best one to answer will be uh, will be himself. Do you think there was one performance that stood out and sort of got you? The, do you think Bahrain, for example, that fourth place think, was that the thing that clinched it for you? I think Bahrain was really good to show that I'm I'm able to deliver um, the best performance of the car and, and to really make the, the best out of the package we give me. So that uh, was my, my second uh, race this year for my first full complete season and and was great to show uh, that I'm able to, to handle the pressure and go and go until the end. And even for myself, I think it was the best way to start to start the season in, in Formula One. So I think this was positive. Monaco, first Monaco GP and going to into q3 and, and finish in seventh position was great and just before the break to finish on uh in sixth position in budapest um uh, best of the rest i think was clearly uh, clearly something positive and and probably helped uh, the the final decision that red bull uh, have taken talk to me about honda because do you think you'll have an advantage having raced with honda throughout this year to be fair, in terms of driving, I, I know a lot of people uh, talk about it, but at such a level, I think, you know, Max after five, maximum six laps will get used to it. In terms of feeling, you know, the response you get inside the car, the way you, um, the drivability, all the things, uh, when when you're such a driver in Formula 1, you don't uh, need much time to, to get used to, to, to that feeling. So I think it's more the way that I've learned how to communicate, how to work with them with a different culture. Japanese are really different than, than the, the culture in Europe and the way they work, the way they behave, the way they, they communicate is slightly different and you need to get used to it. So I think this is clearly an advantage. After inside the car, purely in terms of driving, I don't expect him to take more than, than five or six laps to, yeah. to get used to it. I wasn't actually talking about the performance side of it. I think you hit the nail on the head. Honda have a history of just doing things a bit differently, don't they? And I mean, Fernando Alonso, I think he's proven that you can't take them head on like that. You've got to work with them, haven't you? And is that something you learned in Super Formula? Exactly. And of course this year as well. Yeah, and for me Super Formula in the end was um, was a great year. First on the, of course, on the 
sports side i mean the series itself was was mega but also on the personal side just as a, as a person i've learned a lot about their culture they have a lot of respect and you need to you need really need to understand it when you work with japanese it's all about respect so you can't tell them they do something bad or they, they do something in the wrong way you need to really be explain it and 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 find a way uh and and lead lead them where you 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 want them to go but um you can't be as straightforward as you can be for example in europe with english french or french or italian you, you really need to um be be objective with them and and find a nice way to 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 tell them things so for sure when you go head to head with them uh, usually it turns out uh, in, a, in, a, in a pretty bad way. How long did it take you? That's pretty smart of you, Pierre. How long did it take you to work that out? Because I look at your super formula season, started quite slow and then yeah. bam, something happened. Is it? Does that coincide with you working uh, out how to get the best out of it? Mm, probably a little bit because for sure I've learned it through the season. Um, I would say it was more about the car, getting the the. the learning or to, to set it up properly for, for myself is, was a pretty big change compared to GP2. Um, but clearly, I've read books before. You know, the first time I went in Japan, I went uh, in a country 10,000 kilometers away from my home by myself. And I was going to meet people that I had no idea uh, who they were and, and it was completely like a new life for me. So it was a, a lot of new things to learn. And I've read books about Japanese culture for Christmas. My family bought me uh, like tons of Japanese uh, things just to learn about the culture and, and, and get used to it. And that's one point I understood. But of course, through the season, I've changed my way of working with them um, and, and less uh, vocal thing, but more like writing things on paper just to make sure that we understood the same uh, informations and drawing thing, for example, because of course in Japan, in Super Formula, and we were probably 30 in my team, my engineer, my race engineer was the only one uh, who could communicate with me. And then after I had a translator to speak with other people inside the team, which makes it really tough because we had meeting, uh, meetings with team manager, engineers, five, six people, all in Japanese with a translator, translating things to myself me answering in English and the guy had to translate, but like technical uh, feedback. So really tricky to make sure that everyone understood the same uh, information. So uh, in the end, I was writing everything on paper just to, to make sure we uh, was clear between us. And I understood that was better to repeat things two, three, four times, even if they will say yes, that it's a, it's a, it's a country and they have a culture where they, they can't get into conflicts. So they will never say no to you. So, so even if they disagree, they'll always say yes, but you need to understand with body language when it's a, a true yes or when it's a yes, but they, they don't really uh, agree with you um, or they didn't really get the information you're trying to, to give them. So all the things I've learned it with the with weeks, spending time there and just learning about how they behave and, and how they work. Yeah. How, how fascinating. D did you feel very isolated when you were in Japan? So, yeah, I had... Homesick. Not really, because in the end, I've enjoyed it so much, you know, like just in terms of everything is so clean. People were welcome, welcome, welcome me in the best possible way. Uh, Try to make my life as easy as possible because it was a big change. And and in the end, I've really enjoyed my time there. Um, I had one of my best friends who studied in Japan at the same time. So I was kind of um, hanging out with um, with him. And, uh, and in the end, the people, I really built a strong relationship with the, with the people and inside the team and the people I worked with, with Red Bull Japan as well, that actually my last race when I left and was a pretty tough last one because it was cancelled due to the typhoon and lost the title for, for half a point. So it was probably the, the most difficult thing to swallow of the season. But I was actually pretty sad to leave them. And after all the things they've done, uh, they have done to me to, to, to make my move as easy as easiest as possible um, I really felt like when I had to leave that it was a, a pretty difficult uh, way to say goodbye and, and maybe not to uh, uh, ever see these people uh, again that really did uh, they gave everything there to make my time um, as yeah most comfortable as possible where did you live when you were out there so I 
went there for the races, but most of the time I tried to spend around 10 days uh, just to get used with the jet lag, with the, uh, with the country, spend time with the, with the team. So I didn't have, I was always staying in uh, hotels, um, which sometimes can be pretty funny because in Japan they, they don't have the same hotel than we have. You can have like really small one, everything compacted all together. They have a strange way to... Uh, strange pillows i don't know if you have ever tried oh, the have... bead pillows exactly they're so, not pillows man. <laughs> those so are not you've pillows. got one soft side and <laughs> yes. another side with, with like full of bills inside so if i could tell you the number of nights i've spent in japan putting the bead pillow to one side and yeah. folding up all my dirty shirts and using those as a pillow. yeah I, I, I ended up doing the same thing but uh, yeah it's a lot of, of different things you know the funny one is the toilet is so low for example because japanese people are quite short usually so the side of the toilet is different and it's all electronics. You have like tons of buttons of, uh, on the side. And, and um, yeah, most of the time I had the feet out of the bed because same, the side of the beds are much smaller than You're not that tall either. Yeah, and I'm not that tall. Either, so, <laughs> so no, honestly, it was a, a lot of uh, different things. But yeah, I really enjoyed it because uh, you are so far from everything. You know, I was disconnected from, um, from this European environment. And, um, and I think yeah, I've learned a lot. And, so grown up a lot um, just as, as, a as a person, which was for me, uh, uh, I think, great just for, for myself. What did you do? Tell me what you do of an evening when you were racing at Fuji. What's the name of, <laughs> what's the, name of the town near, near Fuji? Um, um, I, I can't remember where we used to stay there for the Grand Prix, but, but there's not much around there. If, there's not if memory much. Serves. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I, I, I had my trainer there. Um, and either I will stay with the team with my translator and, and just, um, I had an amazing translate, Japanese translator who traveled a bit around the world and went in America, in Europe and, and Japan. And, uh, yeah, it was, I think it was a key, key person there. It just made my, my time there so much better. Um, and yeah, just enjoyed the evenings with, with him, my trainer, a couple of other drivers that were, uh, Lotterer, Andre Lotterer, um, who were there at the same time, Nick Cassidy and Martin Bowles. Just try to, to, to hang out a bit with, uh, with these people. And, and honestly, the, the funny thing in, in, in Japan is wherever you go, you're always surprised in a good way. So it was just about discovering the country, taking the car drive for 20 minutes somewhere and did, and end up in a in a village uh, which look really strange and then go in the first uh, restaurant and finally you find out that the food is just amazing wherever you go so it was just about discovering the country and um, and yeah try to to enjoy as much as I could you strike me as a cup half full kind of guy is that is that a fair assessment what? there's a positivity about you that isn't the case with every driver in Formula One, certainly. My quite, um, yeah, I always look at things in a positive way and, and always try to, in a way, turn the negati negative thing in positive energy um, because, yeah, I'm someone who likes to, to enjoy life and um, I'm pretty easygoing. Um, I have really strong motivation and, and I think for me in my mind, it's really clear what, what I want to achieve. Um, and that's why I always try to turn all the things around me in a positive uh, into positive energy uh, to give me even more um, yeah, motivation um, dedication um, to um, to achieve what I want so. you remind me of Daniel Ricardo in many ways <laughs> that's a compliment, I pro I pro that's a compliment. Yeah. He's, he's, he's fun uh, yeah, probably my smile is not as big as his one but <laughs> <laughs> just your outlook is, is yeah. quite similar so you've come a long way from uh, Rouen yeah now Les Les Sars, yeah. listeners uh, of this podcast who know their history of Formula One will know that there were five Grand Prix, French Grand Prix at Rouen between 1952 and 68, I think. Um, go on, how many times did you drive that Rouen track in your youth? Hey, so the thing is, uh, is now it's closed and uh, there's one part of the track where you, you, you can't go anymore. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I passed it many times because there is an highway right next to the, this track. So, um, yeah, most of the time I was with my dad and he used to tell me stories about this track and that he, um, he had the chance to drive there with some Ferraris in the past. And that's, it was, a uh, uh, a man proper proper man track because it was uh, one of the most dangerous um, there were unfortunately many accidents but you really had to to have 
as we could say, big balls to be fast uh, on that track, like in, in, in the old school track. So um, actually, I, I did drive there uh, recently that year. Someone wanted to make a, a documentary about uh, that track, Juan Les Essars. And he took me there with the car. We managed to open all the roads, um, not all of them, but a part of the track. And, uh, and just to go uh, through these really fast chicanes. I don't know if, if you remember the, the layout, but you had uh, like downhill. With, I was going to say, uh, there was a very steep climb at one point. On the, yeah, on the... Super fast. Yeah, super fast. And there was also like a, a massive downhill, uh, yeah. really fast chicanes. And just unbelievable to imagine that guys were going at, at that time with, uh, was like basically literally bomb on four wheels because as soon as they will crash the, the car will uh, explode and just to imagine that they were going there i don't know 250 uh done this uh this airplane um yeah it was when i when i drove on there i was just massively impressed and i had the chance to try it in the simulator as well but of course it's, it's different but just give you an idea of yeah Oh, in and the Red, safe in and the Red crazy. Bull simulator. What simulator is it? Um, so no, actually, it was just a simulator. Actually, I don't just remember. a thing you had at home, or something. exactly, oh, sort okay. of uh, air factor uh, simulation. But just yeah, it gave me a good idea of of the of the track layout and just to imagine. I saw some footage from the past. Um, unfortunately, we lost uh, like a, a French, uh, really famous French driver there, and um, and yeah, it was. Uh, like it's a pretty big shame that they didn't manage to keep the track open um, because like a lot of people pushed hard to 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 keep it uh, open even without racing but just to have it available um in case you want to yeah just enjoy like the the, the Nürburgring for example but they didn't manage to uh, uh to do it in the end so Ruel okay there is a link to motor racing there but are, are you from a a, a, a racing family is that fair just tell us a little bit about where this passion for driving came from but mom dad clearly uh yeah clearly it's uh, in in my dna because my grandfather used to race um in karting I was a massive fan of of fast cars um and and fast driving as well when at the time it was still possible to go <laughs> fast on the roads um and i did unfortunately i didn't have the chance to to know him um but I, I, I knew my, my um, grandmother, who was a go-kart champion as well. So that's pretty... Uh, and was uh, grandfather a champion as well? So they were both so, champions? So, yeah, he probably won a couple of races. I don't know if he was, wasn't like a super high level, but he just loved uh, racing in general. But my grandmother became uh, like karting champion, uh, regional champion um, at the time. And um, and yeah, of course, my father is a, is a massive fan of of motorsport. He used to race in in karting. He did some um, rally as well, um, some endurance races. Was French dad. champion. Your dad did. Yeah, my dad. Yeah. So only like national national level, but um, yeah, it was still it was a fast uh, was a fast driver, and um, yeah, he did some rally rally stages for for a couple of years, and uh, yeah, it just stopped after after I'm born. He had. A, a pretty uh, big crash um, yeah, on the on the stage, but his co-pilot turned two page at the same time, and just oh, told no. him uh, flat out uh, left in fifth gear and was actually an airplane in second and was a, a mountain uh, stage. So uh, yeah, the, a pretty big crash. Uh, luckily, uh, was alive in the end and and was safe. But uh, yeah, it was uh, the point he decided to stop uh, to stop racing. And I have a pretty big family with four brothers. All uh, older, and um, and three of them raced in karting. So since yeah, since I'm really little, uh, two years old, my mom used to bring me to the track to support uh, all my brothers, and um, and yeah, I wanted to to try. Of course, you've got four brothers. How did mom and dad have time for you? I've, <laughs> I've got three children and they just dominate. So, I can't imagine so they are like two they're, more. They're, I call them brothers because for myself, it is my family. They are both, uh, all four uh, step brothers, um, two from my mom and two from my dad. And, and they, they made me a bit later. So my younger brother is, is nine years older than me. So uh, there, there is a little gap, which I think was really um, positive for myself because when I, I grew up, they were much older than me and it kind of built my my mental um, character, I will say. Um, and, and, you know, it was really positive because they, 
they showed me all the mistakes that I should avoid in my life. So uh, it's been no, uh, it's been fantastic, and we all have a, a fantastic relationship you know, all together. So. Yeah, not only that, but there is a statistic, and I it's something that the, the percentage. The last one is always the best one. Yes, <laughs> no, no, but Pierre, this is true. This is exact. I've had this conversation with Jensen Button because the youngest child you start doing things at a much earlier age than your older siblings because they play with you in the garden and yeah. do whatever else and and therefore you just develop faster and yeah, so that's how i a- i saw them as well like of course as a little brother you look uh, up a lot to your older ones and you look at what they do and and at that time i mean since i'm two years old three of them raised in karting and I loved it. I, I wanted to do mechanic uh, on the cart and I wanted to help them to be fast and to be uh, successful. And, and then after, just in general, in the life, I always um, looked up at, at my brothers um, and really, really in a, in a proud way. Um, and, and they taught me a lot. So we had a lot of fights because they didn't want to play with me Mario Kart because they always used to beat them. I'm gonna say you must have been a really annoying younger <laughs> yeah. brother. Right? <laughs> I always, I always, but since really little, I, I always had this really competitive mindset. And um, whatever thing I do, I always want to to win it. If I do it, it's to be the best. And I always want to play with them, but they 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 got fed up at some point that I always took things so in a competitive way. And um, and as soon as I started to to beat them, they they just uh, got uh, upset. But no, it was it was really funny. I really enjoyed my time, and uh, there were also really good support for myself when I I started karting, single seater, and and also now at the level I am because they are a big fan of racing and and they know what it's all about. You know about the work, the passion, and they really supported me uh, since since my beginning. I started in karting, so. Um, they, do, do they come to races now? They come now, so so of course it's difficult because they all have a job. Uh, so so I think we are any get of them all involved together. in racing? Not or, not no, anymore. No. Um, so they understood that at some point <laughs> <laughs> they were not uh, made to to be professional race car driver. They still drive carts pretty fast, but um, no, they all have a job. And no, actually it's great. I had them all in um, for the first time all together in a race for my title in uh, GP2. Uh, when I got um, the, the GP2 championship, and uh, and then after they came uh, actually all together in Abu Dhabi as well last year. So now we we do spend uh, a lot of good times together. But then of course, I mean, with uh, different commitments for all of them, it's difficult to um, um, just bring them all at the same time. But yeah, they do come uh, sometimes. Being asked for passes the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> Look, what what else are you good at? Because I mean, I've heard football and. Or was it always racing for you, or was there other options so, as well? Yeah, actually, I've been always big, big fan of sport in general, and I started with uh, ice hockey uh, when I was three years old. Um, I did it for two years. Then I, I don't know, I had a bit of a fight with my uh, at the time the the trainer. I wasn't a big fan of the trainer, and then I felt like yeah, it wasn't really my thing. So. I stopped at five. I started football, and uh, yeah, just loved it so much. I'm still a, a massive, massive fan of football, and I I did play from five till eleven years old. So uh, I started my first yeah my first time in go kart at six, um, and then after I just kept going doing the doing both um, both of them at the same time. And um, yeah, I love them both, but I just felt the first time I, I jumped in a go kart, I say okay, that's that's what I want to do in my life. That's racing, driving. Um, I just loved it so much and um, played football. At, I was in the first team in my club, in my in the in the place I live. And um, yeah, one weekend because I missed all the training to go karting, uh, which was my my favorite thing. Um, I came on Sunday to the game and they told me, "Okay, Pierre, you missed uh, too many." practice training um so we're gonna we, we're gonna put you in the b team this weekend and i say guys you know what it's my time to stop i, can, I cannot do the both things at the um, at the top and um, yeah i need to make a decision and i say okay just want to focus on racing now and and just yeah give my best and make sure i put all my chances on my side so what position at football were you so i was on the midfield on the right side um, no, running exactly running a lot so actually yeah. which was fantastic because it built me a good uh, physical condition mm. i was uh, yeah, running uh, for the attack coming back uh, for for the defense so 
I think it was really good as well. Also, the the spirit, you know, it's a um, team spirit, team sport, and um, just know how to play with the others and and really build a uh, real good relationship with all the other players. So, um, in some ways, it's similar to F1 because in F1 it's not individual sport; it's uh, much more team sport than than people could think. Um, and I think in the end, it was a, a really uh, positive experience. So, at what point then did you meet Esteban Ocon? So because I met, read that you you were mates and you did loads together. Yeah, no, of, honestly, the story with Esteban is 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 so long. Like, uh, could speak about it for hours. But um, so basically, it started um, that that his father bought the cart uh, of one of my brother for Esteban. We had one chassis at home that he bought, and that's how they first they first met. Then I started karting um, with the same. Um, engine uh, preparators and Dania at the time, so started to go karting, and then we started to go on the same track. So, but you, and, you live near each other, then? yeah, like thirty minutes away okay, from each right. other, and uh, and we used to train on the same track, and and we used to, of course, we were seven at the time, and 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 of course, we used to spend so much time together, train. Uh, to the same track, going on weekends together. He we used to come at home many times, and same for for myself. We uh, went to his place. I even remember times that in the winter there were nobody coming to uh, to our racetrack, which was uh, Anvil en Bonville, 30 minutes from where I live. We were the only one there, snowing like hell, and we were going for like three, four laps, coming back when our uh, ends were completely freezing. And going in the truck, back of the truck with the with the heater, just to get warm for 15 minutes, and then after going back on track for five of the laps, with uh, the slick tires on, and then just driving on the on the snow. And um, no, honestly, we we did spend like some some fantastic uh, fantastic time together. And like I brothers, think it, like it, brothers, or yeah, almost like like brothers. Because honestly, you know, at the time when you are young, you just need to 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 drive all the time. So we used to to go on Wednesday, on Saturday, on Sunday. Um, and all the time together and I think in the end it was really good because it really pushed us massively you know we both have a really competitive mindset and, and we uh, of course we were uh, really friends at the time and, um, and we really wanted to beat each other so I think it was uh, the best thing which uh, which could have happened to us um, to really push us and, and, and give us all the energy to try to beat each other and in the end it uh, raised uh, our both our, our level. We'll get back to Pierre in a mo. In the meantime, I quickly wanted to tell you a little bit more about the Bose Quiet Comfort 35-2 wireless headphones. These QC 35-2s are the product of nearly two decades of dedicated noise-cancelling research by Bose. And what's really cool about them is that the inbuilt noise-cancelling technology constantly changes and adapts to suit whatever environment you're in. You can adjust the level of noise reduction using three different settings, which, as you can imagine, comes in very handy when I'm down in the F1 paddock and need to focus. I also love the fact that they're wireless because it means I can crack on with whatever I need to do without getting tangled up in any cables. Plus, there's the added bonus that they're optimized for both Amazon Alexa and Google Assistant, meaning they're hands-free as well. So I don't even have to lift so much as a finger to check my schedule, play my music, or check the news. So whether I'm at work or just relaxing at home, these headphones are the ideal companion. And with up to 20 hours battery life, there's absolutely no excuse for you not to work your way through the Beyond the Grid back catalog, is there? But let's finish this episode first. Time to get back to Pierre. So how's the relationship now you're both in Formula One? <laughs> I mean, I've heard a few radio messages from both of you this year. And I, hey, what did you say after lap one at the French Grand Prix this year when you, <laughs> when you crashed into each other? I don't know, but it was massive disappointment. And um, yeah, of course, it was, uh, it was yeah, a terrible moment in, uh, in, in France. I mean, the relationship, unfortunately, got... Um, got yeah a lot worse uh, at some point in karting where when we started to fight for the for the world cup european championship and and also national championship and um i really remember one one weekend the world cup in um, in 2010 um in portugal that uh yeah he literally cut the track uh one corner cut in the grass and eat me 
uh, in the last heat before the, the the pre-final because I was going to start I think second or third and thing it didn't um, didn't really like it and just yeah pushed me off the track spun me and um, and we finished eight I don't know twenties and twenty one or something like this so I had to start the pre-final much uh, more on the back than I was supposed to. And then, yeah, just at that time, we were um, probably used to, to focus a lot on, on, on myself. We used to not go uh, training together anymore. Um, and, um, and then, yeah, it was, uh, actually it wasn't the first time when it started to, to go a bit worse. Uh, it was the Bridgestone Cup in 2009, actually. One race in Merth that uh, started last in final. I didn't, my engine didn't start in pre-final. And um, yeah, I overtook him in the last corner of the last lap for the third position. And uh, we had a bit of a contact, a little contact and finished third, finished fourth. And uh, yeah, from that race started to to, to go bad. And then after uh, the, the, the years went down, uh, we found each other in Formula Renault 2 liters. We had many battles, started the first race bouncing each other, touching wheels and, and, and with smoking wheels uh, all the race. And, uh, and yeah, it was, was just a big fight, but I tried to, on my side, I tried to, to keep the relationship as good as I could. I came um, to see him a couple of times to say, okay, like just just stop these this stupid things uh, we are doing. And you know, like now we are in European Championship or even World Championship in other different series. And, just do your thing. I do my thing. You at the time it was with Gravity as well with the Renault program. I was with Red Bull and say it's uh, better to focus uh, both on uh, our own careers and try to make the best out of it. And I, I think it wasn't really um, never really show me wanted to to keep the relationship in a in a good way. So after that we. Do you talk? Do you talk? Yeah, I mean, we, we can't speak, but everything out of racing, I think so. <laughs> does it so, is, does it make you a bit sad that I think you've someone you've known all your life, you can't yeah. separate the job and the I, 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 the thing is, I'm trying to even I'm trying to make the story a uh, long story, short story, you know, and um, and there are many things that happen as well. Um, that I, I didn't really, really like, uh, sort of, you know, I, I respect all the people that respect me and, and the day you don't respect me, then I lose all my, my respect for, for you as well. So that's a bit uh, how it works. And I've been disappointed, uh, more than once. So, um, so yeah, after this point, you know, many times, uh, I was waiting apologies from his side and never really came. So at some point I said, okay, then. Um, there is not much, not much I can do. Just focus on myself, and I let him, let him uh, do, do, do what he wants. Um, but um, no, you know, I think in the end we really respect each other as a, as a driver. Uh, we spent some amazing time together, uh, talking like if it was my girlfriend. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, I mean we, we did spend some, some great time um, together when we were young, and, and I think in the end it was a positive thing that. Um, this thing happened to us because it really pushed us so much harder um, to beat each other. And in the end, you know, like uh, it's 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 quite funny to to see both of us uh, knowing Formula One, uh, looking at where we we started and with our truck, not much money, going to to take the the tires uh, at the back of the garage from all the guys, and just to see the the way we grew up and and where we are now. It's, it's just um, it's, it's just fantastic. So yeah, I think we really respect each other as a, as a driver. But unfortunately, there is not this uh, this link that we that we had in the past, uh, which was uh, yeah much much more uh, friendly. Does it feel odd that you're going into one of the big three next year and he probably won't have a drive in Formula One? Well, you know, since I'm seven years old, I've always fought with him, and I'm sure I'm gonna f- keep fighting with him in the next few years. So. Um, no, I think for sure, yes, I think F1 is, is, is pretty tough. Uh, there's a lot of things you need to put together to, um, to, to, to get your chance and, and many things are out of the, uh, out of your hands, uh, as a driver. And, um, and this is pretty, pretty tough sometimes. So I think he's in one of these situations that he's doing his, his job and, and things out of his control are not really going his way. Um, so no, I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that 
we'll keep pushing and we'll see him back on the grids uh, pretty soon. And I'm sure we'll keep having some some good <laughs> fights. And actually, I enjoy it in a way. You know, it's uh, it's great, and uh, you know, we have a, a good uh, rivalry. And um, yeah, as long as we we keep it clean, even if it's difficult, sometimes uh, it's um, it's the the most important. That's one friendship that racing has turned a bit sour. Yeah. Do you worry that the same thing might happen between you and Max, for example, next year? Honestly, I didn't really think about it. And um, yeah, as I said earlier, you know, the, the main point is respect. And I think as long as you respect each other, nothing nothing can, hap- can happen. Um, and that's the way I see things. You know, I'm really usually friendly and... Uh, I have many friends like to to get me into a fight with someone means really the the person needs to do something something uh, um, disrespectful and um, no I think with Max at the moment we have we have a strong relationship uh, respect between each other and and I'm I'm sure that as long as we keep it clean um, things will will go well but uh, yeah, I really hope we can we can keep that uh, friendship that we have now. Do you worry a little bit that you're walking into his team next year? My people tend to say this, but uh, I've stopped listening to what people say. Since, uh, <laughs> I'm not saying <laughs> no, I'm just no, asking the question. Yeah, yeah. For, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that you are asking the question, <laughs> but people, that's that's what people tend to say. And it could be true in a way, you know, he's got more experience than me with Red Bull. But I, I do think that as a driver, it's your job as well to make your position inside the team. And with with your character, showing your ambitions, what you want. And um, and that will be my job to 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 make my uh, my position there. So, of course, it's not easy. He's a uh, he's a character. Uh, he's got a lot of support from his management, um, and and he's really talented guy. So, uh, by his management, do you mean Helmut Marco? Not or? really no. Helmut, but you know, he's he, he has a manager. He has okay. his dad yeah. who was involved in Formula One, and I come yeah. from like a, a really different family. I'm the, uh, yeah. happiest probably happiest, happiest uh, son uh, or kid and I'm really proud of my family but you know like my father wasn't a Formula 1 driver I don't have any manager um, I, I came with a lot of support from the federation and I was lucky enough to have people around me uh, who were really like positive and, and a lot of people who helped me to, to make my way through but at the end of the day I don't have any manager or people uh, alongside me to to make things moving you know I need to make things moving by myself and um, which is in a way I think a strength because I, I've learned a lot from from that position and um, it, it also gave me a lot more uh, mental strength um, but yeah Max have some some strong people around him that really take care uh, good care of him and um, I think for, for him he's been his father has been a, a really good help good support and Raymond, uh, his manager, also uh, probably made the things a bit easier with the experience he had with uh, with yours. Of course, they worked together, didn't they, back in the day? They yeah, worked exactly. together for years. Which is a pretty amazing story yeah. as well. So. Yeah. Um, well, look, we talked about Esteban, we've talked about Max, just driver's parade, typical driver's parade. You're on the bus. Who, who do you chat to? Have you, you know, you've only been in here a year. We're kind of back where we started, but have you made any mates on the grid is it possible yeah. to have mates it seems quite yeah. difficult when you yeah. talk about Ocon I mean no I mean Esteban is is really unfortunately the the, the only one where we didn't manage to keep the the, the real friendship um, last and, and and that's a shame but honestly with all the other drivers and mega relationship um, I, I get on pretty well with with everyone I mean of course Red Bull driver Daniel uh, who is impossible not to to like um, and yeah, just amazing, amazing guy. Uh, Max Stoffel, um, also Seb. I get on really well with Seb, and uh, it's been it's been a good help for me as well. After my GP2 title, Seb uh, Vettel, we're talking yeah, about. Seb Vettel, yeah, he's, how, he's did, been, how did he help you after GP2? So I just went to see him after GP2 because, of course, I was um, yeah, it was pretty difficult, you know, for me winning GP2 championship. Um, and not getting the chance straight in in Formula One and being at the at the wrong uh, good yeah uh, good place but wrong time um, and yeah I just went to see him to see okay what do you think about my situation and how do you see things and what kind of advice you could give me you know and uh, um, we, we we sat down together I remember in Mexico after the after the drivers briefing and I just uh, you know like just super friendly and super nice. Um, from him, from himself, just to yeah, 
tell me his experience with Red Bull and what he thinks, what I should do, and the sort of um, yeah that advice that a world champion could uh, could give to a, a younger driver. And did he suggest still now, Super Formula or was it? Yeah, he told me was uh, for him was a was a great uh, a great chance to to go uh, abroad and. He was sure that, yeah, just told me, like, you just need to keep pushing and, and show them that you don't give up because, you know, they, they keep testing you. Red Bull is a, is a program where they keep testing you every day to see how strong you are mentally. Um, Even now you're in Formula One, they're like that, do you feel? Yeah, they always, they in a way, they're, of course, a bit less in Formula One, but um, they kind of always test you, you know, and uh, and Helmut is like this and he's sort of his game as well so so once you you, you get it uh, you know to 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 handle things but that's a bit the way um that they are with the drivers and uh yeah honestly it was was great to to catch up with him and even now with the with the position i mean and i'm gonna be we, we spoke with seb uh, a bit and, um yeah for me it's really uh in the, at the end of the day is one of my um my idol, I could say, I mean, if it sounds a bit strange, but someone that I looked at when I was younger um, in karting and um, and Evan, it's great to be Formula One with him now and, and, and we're going to fight next year. But uh, it's really someone that I, I respect a lot and that is uh, impressive as a, as a person. I think he's really smart and, and really simple, humble as well. And uh, for me, I really enjoy to to catch up with this with this kind of guy and and always learn things from from their experience. Yeah, same with Lewis. Of course, he's more a bit more difficult to 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 catch up during the weekend. But yeah, we did uh, uh, see a couple of times out of the of the track and same like just the kind of tips uh, this legend of Formula One can give you are always always useful. Um, and then after the people more from my generation, so. Uh, Stoffel, uh, Charles, we know since yeah, more or less the same, uh, same age as Esteban, seven years old. So um, all these guys that uh, yeah, we 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 tend to catch up a lot during the the race week. Do you feel a responsibility being you know a French driver in a top team now? Do you feel France hasn't had a world champion for a <laughs> while? <laughs> We've been world champion this year, though, in soccer. So uh, <laughs> that's true. But, <laughs> but um, no, yeah, for sure. They Scraping is. the barrel a bit, but yeah. it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, no, for sure. Actually, we were speaking uh, with them the other day, and just yeah, remembered that the last uh, win from a French driver was in '96. So uh, from Panis in, in Monaco, so... And that was a fluke, let's yeah. say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's sort he's of still, been he's still, he still won it, so <laughs> in the book he's still there. But um, yeah, I mean, it's been 22 years and um, even if French driver, France in general has been so much involved in Formula 1, we didn't really have um, driver. I think Romain Grosjean was pretty close a couple of times at the time he was in Lotus, but it's been so many so many years that uh, we didn't hear the French uh, anthem on the uh, during a race weekend so uh, in Formula 1 so yeah, hopefully you know that's my target of course if I'm in Formula 1 as I said I really um, know what I want to achieve in F1 and if I do this it's to be world champion one day and, and I'll do everything I can and put all my energy uh, uh, into this uh, into this target because that's something I've said to myself when I was young I said I want to be world champion in Formula One and um, you know, I'm quite stubborn and when I have something in mind, I just do everything I can until I, I make it happen. So, um, yeah, I will, do, I will do everything I can. Alain Prost? A legend. <laughs> yeah. He's a legend, isn't he? Yeah. He's following his legend footsteps. and the, the greatest or one of the, of the greatest um, F1 driver of, of all time. I think he's been so successful. Um, and and just the guy, the guy itself is unbelievable. So I had the chance to catch up with him a couple of times, and just the, the way he is uh, makes you makes you no, show shows you the the legend he is. So of course, as a French driver, is uh, one of my uh, one of my idol, and it just stays so simple. You know, you you see him in the paddock, and you can just stop him and and speak with him five minutes, and he's really open. Um, and a yeah, great advisor as well. And actually, he's been he's helped me quite a lot over the the last two years. I, I used to to phone him as well. I like to take ex experience and and listen uh, advices from more uh, more experienced guys or, or drivers. And um, as he was in Renault, um, 
we did call each other a couple of times. Um, so at the time when I was when I wasn't in F1, just so was letting me know uh, a bit of the of the F1 market and. Renault was with Toro Rosso and and just to try to help me um, with my with my situation in a really uh, really friendly way and uh, yeah I wasn't um, obliged to do it you know it was uh, with Renault I was with Red Bull and uh, and uh, yeah it's been um, yeah just really helpful and really uh, supportive in a way as well so uh, been uh, pretty lucky and it's pretty imp- impressive person. It seems to me you don't need a manager. Because you're, you're doing it all very well. There's one thing, though. Whenever it comes to talking about money and trying to screw that last whatever it is out of a team, out of a sponsor, good cop, bad cop, right? You you want to be the good cop, don't you? Exactly. You need a guy to go in and be the bad cop. Who does that? Myself. You, you still have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, but it's it's great life experience as well because, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I learn a lot of things from, from these kind of situations and... Uh, of course, sometimes it's a bit difficult because my position is is a dr- driver position and it's to focus on the on the track and um, and you know just to, to to drive fast and then after the manager should do everything for yourself. But I need to. I have sort of both uh, status and it's. Um, I would say some people will say it's not ideal. Some others uh, will say it's better because I have a straight link with the people and my bosses in a way. So, you know, if, if Emut uh, is not happy or wants to tell me something, he tells it to me straight away. And in the other way, um, yeah, I, I'm really straightforward with him now as well, but I think I'm quite a, a fair guy, objective as well. Um, and, and in a way, I'm pretty sure he liked it as well that there, there have never been any sort of uh, people in between us and things have always been really clear um, between us so that the way it is um, of course it's not easy when you need to start talking about figures but uh, yeah the best thing I can do is just to to, to show my potential on track and then things get uh, easier uh, to manage uh, off track well uh, Gerhard Berger he never had a manager and he always says he probably made... earned more money like yeah, exactly this. <laughs> you haven't got to give any of it away have you? <laughs> Well, Pierre, thank you for your time. It's been fabulous to catch up and just to learn some of your story. It's an amazing story. Uh, really, thanks to you as well. And um, great chat. Good luck with it all. Thank and you very we'll much. catch up again soon. Thanks. Cheers. Esteban Ocon, Honda, the Japanese way. There were so many little gems in that chat but there was undoubtedly a deep-rooted sadness linked to the breakdown of his childhood friendship with Ocon that bugs him to this day. On a more positive note, Pierre's understanding of Japanese work ethic will stand him in good stead next year when Red Bull link up with Honda. It'll be fascinating to see what he can achieve. A big thanks to you, Pierre, for your time. Well, that's it for another week, but we'll be back in just seven sleeps with another F1 superstar. In the meantime, please subscribe to Beyond the Grid if you haven't already. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and your favourite podcast app. And I love your feedback. Please feel free to drop me a line using the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. And you can tweet me at Tom Clarkson F1. Sarah Jones did just that last week, telling me that the podcast is ideal Saturday night listening. Saturday night fever, Sarah. Well... Where and when you listen to the show, the team here and I would love to hear the most surreal setup. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out.